this evening, I hope you brought, you brought your pillow and your blanket, <laughs> we are going to uh, study the section in the syllabus titled Resurrections in the Bible. Of course, we're going to deal with the 144,000, the special resurrection, how Ellen White re uh, relates to the 144,000, the problem with Sister Hastings, and so on. But before we do, we want to have a word of prayer. So let's just bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, what a high day this has been. We have enjoyed uh, the study of your word. We have enjoyed the fellowship together. We've enjoyed the good food. We've enjoyed walking out in the midst of nature. Uh, everything has just been phenomenal. And we thank you, Father, for having been with us during the course of this day. And Father, now once more, as we are about to open your holy book, we ask that the same Spirit that inspired the book might come back to this place and through the ministry of the angels enlighten our minds and open our hearts so that we might have in our hearts that blessed hope, the coming of the Lord. We ask, Father, that you will help us understand what we're going to study. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, some of this will be review. I did this study of all of the resurrections that I know of in the Bible. So we're going to go through all of these uh, so that we can set the stage and understand the framework of the last resurrections that will take place. Now let's talk first of all about the Old Testament resurrections. And you have the text here in your syllabus. It's page 77 in your syllabus. By the way, some of you have been asking, those of you who uh, did not register for the full seminar, if we have this syllabus available. And the answer is, after sundown today, uh, we will have uh, some extras of this available if you would like to get one or, or you would like to get an extra one to take to someone. So they will be available. Uh, meanwhile, those of you who do have, if you have somebody next to you, uh, make sure that you share the syllabus so that they can follow along as well. The first Old Testament resurrection that we know of is the resurrection of whom? The resurrection of Moses. Now you'll notice that in this section there are three texts. The first of those is Deuteronomy 34 verses 5 and 6. And there are two strange things about these two verses. Two strange details. It says there, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. And now notice this. By the way, who is uh, this verse talking about? It's talking about uh, the servant of whom? Of the Lord. And then it says, And he buried him. Who buried him? The Lord buried him. Incidentally, I might share this as a, as a little, uh, little tidbit, which is very important. The Lord did not come down and bury Moses. The angels buried Moses. Because what God accomplishes in Scripture is attributed to God, but it's performed by the angels, including the miracles of Christ. Now, this is a novel idea for, for most Adventists. They, they, they find this to be very strange. But I studied this out in detail. I've been studying it for over 25 years. And uh, the more I study, the more evidence I find in Scripture that what the Bible attributes to God, God does, but He does it through the ministration of the angels. Uh, Ellen White says that the chariot wheels of Pharaoh were, were taken off by angels. She says that the walls of Jericho were knocked down by angels. She says, and I discovered this one recently, she says that an, an angel struck Uzzah dead. So time and again in the Old Testament, God is doing these things through the ministry of angels. They are the messengers of God that keep heaven in communication with the earth. Now that's just a sidelight. If you want more on this, there's a series called Revisiting the Godhead. And I believe that when, when you understand the role of angels, you no longer have any problem with the personality of the Holy Spirit. The problem that we have with the Holy Spirit is, you know, because... The Bible uses things like oil 
and rain and fire and wind to speak about the Spirit. We have this idea that the Holy Spirit is some kind of substance that oozes. But the Holy Spirit is a person. And the Holy Spirit is a pl in a place. In fact, Ellen White says that he is the commander now of the angelic host. He's the rep she, she says he's the representative of the commander of the Lord's hosts. And who is the, rep who is the commander? Jesus. And who is the representative of the commander? Whom did Jesus send? The Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is a person, and He simply accomplishes the will of God through the ministration of the angels. It's a tremendous concept. Anyway, that's not the point. So it says, <laughs> He buried him, the Lord buried him, in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. And now notice, another anomaly. And no one knows his grave to this day. That's unusual, because the Hebrews marked the graves of their heroes. Abraham was buried in the cave of Machpelah. The tomb of David supposedly can still be seen in Jerusalem today, right near the upper room, what is believed to be the upper room. And recently, archaeologists found a tomb that says, here lies Daniel the prophet. I don't know if you're aware of that. Of course, there was no body in it. But it had the inscription that Daniel was buried there. And so the Jews marked the tombs of their heroes. But in the case of Moses, first of all, it says that God buried him, the only person in Scripture that I know of that God buried. And secondly, we find that no one knew where his tomb was. And then notice in Matthew 17, verse 3, it says, And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, that is to Jesus and the three apostles that followed Jesus to the Mount of Transfiguration, talking with him. Now wait a minute. Moses is talking to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, which means that this, what must have happened? Moses must have what? Moses must have resurrected. You say, well, how do you know that that... Uh, how do you know that that was Moses? Well, the text says it was Moses. By the way, if it wasn't Moses, then God is breaking his own rule that the dead cannot communicate with the living. Are you following me or not? So this was Moses. Incidentally, um, an individual wrote to me telling me that I was totally wrong when in one of my lectures uh, I said that Moses had been resurrected and he had been taken to heaven and that he appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he used a series of very interesting arguments. I think he maybe was a member of the Worldwide Church of God, which really no longer exists. It's split up into many different uh, groups. Uh, and so we corresponded co for quite an extended period of time. He sent me his objections, and I would search the Scriptures and find answers to his objections. And then he would write more objections, and I would search the Scriptures and find answers to those objections. If any of you would be interested in having a copy of that correspondence, I'll be glad to share it with you because you will meet people that will say that Moses was not resurrected, that what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration was that Jesus received a vision, but it was not Moses. And by the way, this individual also had all sorts of arguments to say that Elijah was not taken to heaven and that Enoch was not taken to heaven. And so we need to have an explanation for this. So, but I believe that Scripture proves that Moses resurrected from the dead. He's on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, when we connect this with Jude 9, it becomes very clear. Let's read uh, Jude. Actually, I should have included this. Well, it is there. Jude 9 says, Yet Michael the archangel, who is Michael? Now, we need to make it clear to people that when we say Jesus is Michael, it doesn't mean that, that like the Jehovah's Witnesses, that Jesus is the first angel created by God. We need to let people understand that, that Jesus is Michael, the archangel, but he's eternal God. Our view is, is different uh, than the Jehovah's Witness. So it says, Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about what? The body of Moses. So what is Michael doing? He's fighting with the devil over what? The body of Moses. 
And I say this reverently. Do you suppose that God is a heavenly vulture fighting over dead flesh? Had Michael come to fight over a dead body? Absolutely not. So it says here, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now the text that we need to connect with this one is 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16, which is describing the second coming of Christ. And I want you to notice the terminology that is used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. For the Lord himself, who is this person? Jesus. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of Oh, interesting. With the voice of an archangel. Which archangel? The only one that we find in Scripture. Michael is the only archangel mentioned in Scripture. Gabriel is a, is a cherubim, but he's not an archangel. And so it says, with the voice of, of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and what does Michael come to do here? What does uh, the archangel come to do in 1 Thessalonians 4? And the dead in Christ will rise first. So is there biblical evidence that um, very clearly Moses was resurrected by Jesus Christ? And that Jesus Christ is the archangel? Yes, because when Jesus comes, he comes with the voice of what? Of the archangel. So that's the first resurrection in the Old Testament. Now let's go to the second resurrection in the Old Testament, the son of the widow of Zarepta. 1 Kings chapter 17 and verses 17 and verses 21 and 22. Chapter 17, verse 17 and then 21 and 22. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. Was he dead? Absolutely. Verse 21. And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back into him. The word soul there is nephesh. It is translated many times in the Old Testament, life. It does not say immortal conscious soul. It says his soul. And perhaps I might be able to say something about Bible versions. I've said this at 3 ABN, but I'll say it here as well. Some people say, if the King James was good enough for Christ, it's good enough for me. <laughs> In other words, there are those who are King James only. Now let me explain my point of view concerning versions. I believe that the manuscripts from which the King James Version was translated are the best manuscripts. The Textus Receptus. But I do not believe that the King James translation is always the best translation of those manuscripts. The translation of the King James is not inspired. There are mistakes of translation in the King James Version. There are many mistakes in the translation, for example, of words that have to do with the state of the dead. For example, the Old Testament word, Sheol. And the New Testament equivalent in Greek is the word Hades or Hades. The King James, in almost every single reference, translates the word Sheol or Hades, hell. And that creates a huge problem for us. For example, Job says, if I descend to hell. So Job went to hell. No. Because then he speaks about being like a, like a jar of clay and returning to the dust. Almost in every one of these references that use the word Sheol or the word Hades, you can translate grave. And so does the much maligned NIV version. The NIV version translates grave. It's a better translation. You know, you, many times where the word soul appears, the NIV translates person. Or it translates living being. Is that a better translation of what the soul is? Absolutely. Now, don't say that the pastor board doesn't like the King James. I like the King James. It's a good version of the Bible. 
the manuscripts are the best. But that doesn't mean, doesn't mean that we always believe that the translation of the King James Version is the best translation. Are you understanding my point? Very, very important point. Now, so it says here, O oh Lord my God, I pray let this child's soul, which is the word nephesh, his life, come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul, that is the life of the child, came back to him and he what? And he revived. That's the second resurrection from the Old Testament. The third resurrection from the Old Testament is a strange episode. 2 Kings 13 and verse 21 has this interesting detail. And we need to realize that Elisha is a type of Christ. There's the key. Elisha is a type of Christ. It says in 2 Kings 13, 21, So it was, as they were burying a man, that suddenly they spied a band of raiders, and they put the man in the tomb of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. <laughs> Interesting episode, isn't it? Let me ask you, when we come in contact with the death of Christ, does that bring life? It most certainly does. And so here we have this individual who resurrected when he touches the bones of Elisha. Now these are the three resurrections from the Old Testament. Now let's take a look at three resurrections during the ministry of Christ. Let's go to Luke chapter 7, verses 11 to 15. This is the son of the widow of Nain. Luke 7, 11 to 15. Now it happened the day after that he went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin. And those who carried him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he presented himself to his mother. Do you think those people were very much surprised? Whew. Just use your imagination what it must have been like. This kid was dead in there and all of a sudden, boop, he pops out his head. Now, the second resurrection in the Gospels is the resurrection of the daughter of Jairus, the prince of the synagogue. Luke 8, verses 41 and 42, and then we'll read verses 49 through 55. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had only an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. While he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus, verse 50, But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Do not be afraid, only believe, and she will be made well. When he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John and the father and mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her. But he said, do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. I love that expression. She's not dead. She's sleeping. We shouldn't be any more afraid of death than we are to go to bed at night. Verse 53. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside took her by the hand and called, saying, Little girl, arise! Then her spirit returned, and she rose immediately, and he commanded that she be given something to eat. So This is the second resurrection in the New Testament. Let's go to the third. You know about this one. I'm not even going to read a verse. You, it's, it's covered in the whole chapter, chapter 11 of the Gospel of John. Uh, and I want you to notice the comment by Ellen White in Selected Messages, Volume 1. You should have that, Volume 1, page 304. She says, During his ministry, Jesus raised the dead to life. 
He raised the son of the widow of Nain, the daughter of Jairus, and Lazarus. But these were not clothed with immortality. After they were raised, they continued to be what? To be subject to death. So did they die again? If any of these people are lost, they'll die three times. <laughs> we won't get into that. Now there's also one more resurrection that we find in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 20. You remember the Apostle Paul? He began preaching after sundown and he preached till after midnight. You think I'm long-winded. <laughs> you don't know the Apostle Paul. You really had to bring your pillow and your blanket for the Apostle Paul. What happened with Eutychus? He was sitting in a window. Uh, probably on the second floor. <laughs> he went to sleep. Shame, shame. It wasn't Paul's fault. You know, he goes to sleep and he falls out of the window and he's dead. Now notice what happens in Acts 29 and 10. And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep. <laughs> he was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from, oh, it was actually a third story. He fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. So what happened with Eutychus? He resurrected. Did he die again? All of these individuals died again. They were not raised to immortality. So we have three resurrections in the Old Testament. We have three resurrections in the Gospels. And we have one resurrection in the book of Acts. Now you say, wait a minute, there's another resurrection in the Gospels. Yes, this is a special resurrection. That's our next section. New Testament resurrection of people who did not die again. See, there's the difference. All the ones we've studied so far died again. But these did not die again. Notice Matthew 27, 51 through 53. This is when Jesus said, It is finished. Into your hands I commend my spirit. It says there, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. And the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Notice, fallen asleep. That's interesting. Fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves, when? After His resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, what was the function of this resurrection? What was the purpose? Each one of these resurrections has a special and particular purpose. What was the purpose of this resurrection? Actually, the purpose was twofold. Number one, so that they could go forth and they could proclaim that Jesus had resurrected. That's one. And secondly, they would be taken by Jesus 40 days after His resurrection into the presence of the Father as a down payment or a sample of the general resurrection at the end of the age. In fact, let's notice this statement from Ellen White on Matthew 27, 51 to 53, Selective Messages, Volume 1, in pages 304 and 305. She says, but those who came forth, this is a continuation of the statement that we read just a little bit earlier, but those who came forth from the grave at Christ's resurrection were raised to everlasting life. They were the multitude of captives that ascended with Him as trophies of His victory over death and the grave. You see, this is reflecting a custom in antiquity. When a king went and he conquered a city, you know what he would do? He would organize a procession when he came back to his capital city. And in the procession, they would bring carts with all of the booty that they were bringing from the city. And then also with chains. We have archaeological pictures of this. With chains around their necks were the captives that he had brought from the city that he had conquered. See, that's a custom in antiquity. And so Jesus came and he ransacked the kingdom of the devil. 
and he's going to bring back these captives that he rescued from the grave at the moment of his resurrection. Now, it's interesting. There are two Hebrew feasts that we need to take a look at in conjunction with uh, the resurrection of this group. And by the way, the resurrection of Jesus Christ as well. The first feast is the Feast of the First Fruits. Do you know that a sheaf was taken and waved before the Lord on uh, what is known as the first fruits? See, Jesus died at Passover, right? The 14th of Nisan. At what time? Three o'clock in the afternoon, between the two evenings. The two evenings are when the sun reaches its climax and begins to set, and the second evening is when the sun actually sets. Jesus died between the two evenings, according to Exodus chapter 12 and verse 6. So Jesus dies at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, about the ninth hour. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? About the ninth hour. It wasn't the ninth hour yet. It was the ninth hour when he said, it is finished. Into your hands I commend my spirit. And then Jesus dies. His body is prepared like the Passover lamb was prepared. And when the sun sets, Jesus is resting where? Jesus is resting in the tomb. Do you know what the feast was after the feast of the Passover? It was the feast of unleavened bread the very next day. Jesus rested in the tomb as the bread who had no leaven because his body had no sin. And therefore, Peter says, his body saw no corruption. Are you with me? And then the very next day, the Hebrew feasts say that it was the day after the Sabbath. So whether it's the ceremonial Sabbath or the seventh-day Sabbath, it makes no difference. Because it was the, the first day of the week was the day after the ceremonial Sabbath of the unleavened bread. And it was the day also after the seventh-day Sabbath. So the very next day was the Feast of the first fruits, And what the, the, the priest would do, he would go cut a sheaf of fruit. Actually, in this case, it would be the barley in the spring. And he would bring a sheaf and he would wave that sheaf before the Lord. Now, what does that waving of the sheaf on resurrection morning represent? Well, let's read from Desire of Ages 785 and 786 in your syllabus. Christ arose from the dead as the what? As the first fruits. You can read the biblical text. As the first fruits of those that slept. He was the antitype of the what? Ah, which wave sheaf? The one at the feast of first fruits. He was the antitype of the wave sheaf. And his resurrection took place on the very day when the wave sheaf was to be presented before the Lord. And if I might add, he, Jesus, went to heaven on resurrection morning. And he was met by his father at the entrance of the sanctuary. And Jesus presented himself there alive before his father. And do you know what time it happened? At 9 o'clock in the morning. You say, where do you get that from? It's very simple. Listen carefully. Pentecost took place exactly 50 days after the first fruits were offered. You're not with me. Yeah? Pentecost was exactly 50 days after the first fruits were weighed before the Lord. What hour of the day was the Holy Spirit poured out? Do you remember Acts chapter 2? The people, the people were saying, oh, these guys were babbling. They're drunk. And what does Peter say? How can they be drunk if it's only the third hour? Which is what time? Jesus appeared before his father at 9 a.m. on the first day of the week. By the way, the next series that we're going to produce at Secrets Unsealed is a, is a series on the Hebrew feast. Right now we're doing another series, the Bible versus tradition. But after that, we're going to do a 14, uh, maybe 16-part series on the Hebrew feasts. I did that many years ago. We have it only on CD. Uh, we transferred it from audio cassette, but now we're going to do it on DVD. And I'm going to deal with some issues that I didn't deal with in the first series because it wasn't an issue in the Adventist church. Uh, two of these presentations is going to deal with the issue of the lunar Sabbath. 
the idea that we're supposed to keep the Sabbath according to the moon and not according to the sun. And two others are going to deal with the issue of whether God expects us to keep the Hebrew feasts or not. So uh, I'm going to deal in 12 lectures with the Hebrew feasts, and then we're going to deal with those other two issues in uh, the additional four lectures. Now, um, it's interesting that on the day of Pentecost, first fruits were also waved before the Lord. Are you with me? You can read that, and uh, it's, the reference is there. Leviticus 23 and verse 20, first fruits were presented before the Lord also at Pentecost. Now, what were these first fruits that were presented at Pentecost? I thought that the first fruits was when Jesus resurrected. What were the first fruits on the day of Pentecost? The first fruits were that Jesus took captivity captive and he presented in heaven before his Father those whom he had rescued from the grave when he resurrected from the dead. Are you with me? Now, let's read what Ellen White has to say about this. I have three statements here. Desire of Ages, page 786. She speaks about who these who resurrected with Jesus were. They were those who had been co-laborers with God and who at the cost of their lives, so they were martyrs, right? Who at the cost of their lives had borne testimony to the truth. Now they were to be witnesses for Him who had raised them from the dead. In Desire of Ages 8.33, she says, All heaven was waiting to welcome the Savior to the celestial courts. This is at the ascension. As He ascended, He led the way, and the multitude of captives set free, and His resurrection followed. And then Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 305, she says, So those who had been raised were to be presented to whom? To the universe. With what purpose? As a what? As a pledge. What's a pledge? You know, you can pledge to secrets unsealed. <laughs> a pledge is something that indicates that something is going to happen in the future, right? And so these individuals who were presented before the universe they're presented as a pledge of something that's going to happen in the future. What is that pledge? It says, so those who had been raised were to be presented to the universe. The whole universe was there. Let me ask you, was the Father there? The one on the throne. Was the Son there? The Lamb as though He had been slain. Was the Holy Spirit there? The seven spirits. Were the cherubim and seraphim there? The four living creatures. Were the representatives of the world there? Twenty-four elders. Was all the angelic hosts there? Ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands. It says in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 11. So she says, those who had been raised were to be presented to the universe as a pledge of the resurrection of all who believe in Christ as their personal Savior. Phenomenal. So, you think Jesus is going to resurrect His people when He comes? See, you don't have to say, well, we hope so. No, He's already paid the pledge. <laughs> He's already given the down payment, if you please, so we can be sure. Now, let's go to our next section. Two end-time resurrections. We're talking about general resurrections now. Two end-time general resurrections. The key text is in John 5, 28 and 29, which I'm sure you're acquainted with. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear His voice. And what? And come forth. Not come down. Come forth. Forth from where? From the grave. So where are the dead? In the grave. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. How many resurrections? Two. Is there any time indication as to when these two take place? No. It simply says that there's going to be a resurrection of the righteous and there's going to be a resurrection of the wicked. Now, if you want to know when the righteous are going to resurrect and when the wicked are going to resurrect, you have to go to another book that John wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You have to let John interpret John. 
Where do we find that evidence of who resurrects in the first resurrection and who resurrects in the second resurrection? You have to go to Revelation chapter 20. Now, let's read some texts that speak about the general resurrection of the righteous. This is, see, this Jesus comes from heaven in his second coming, and he doesn't touch the earth. Uh, it takes several days for him to come down from heaven. When he's above the earth, when he's arrived and he's above the earth, then you have the general resurrection of the righteous. In a few moments, we're going to come to the special resurrection that takes before that, the place before that. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who who sleep in Jesus, and some people have a problem with that. It appears to be a problem, right? Because it says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So they say, you know, uh, God cannot uh, bring with Jesus those who slept unless they're in heaven with him. Are you understanding me? But what they don't understand is that not reading the text carefully. Let me ask you this. At the second coming, does God the Father come to the earth? No. You read in Acts chapter 3, verses 19 to 21, it says, He shall send forth Jesus. The Father remains in heaven at the second coming. Jesus does come in the glory of His Father, but the Father does not come. The Son comes. Now, what does this text mean when it says he will bring with Jesus? Well, most people interpret it that, you know, when Jesus comes to this earth, he's going to bring the, he's going to bring the departed souls to unite their souls with the body. Because it says he will bring with Jesus. But you see, what the emphasis really is, is that God is in heaven and he's bringing with Jesus to heaven those who went to sleep. You're not with me. God will bring with him, where? To where the Father is, those who slept in Jesus. So it's not Jesus bringing the people with him here, it's Jesus bringing the people from him down here, up there. Now let's go back here. Verse 15, For, we say, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Notice he doesn't come all the way to the earth. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Is that a wonderful, wonderful passage? We're going to see our friends and relatives again. Praise God. The members that were lost through death. You know, my church at Fresno Central uh, has a turnover of probably about 80%. I inherited a very old church. And most of those who were at the church when I came there are dead. I've done many, many funerals, but the Lord has brought several new members to the church, both by transfer and also by baptism, uh, and people that have, that, you know, that have come out of the woodwork. The, the church has not suffered numerically or spiritually because the Lord has been there to replace the, the beloved saints who have passed away. I look forward to meeting many of those people who were old when I arrived. I want to see what they were like when they were young. I might not even recognize them. But I look forward to that day. It's going to be a wonderful day. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 55. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on in immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Powerful resurrection passage. Now, if we must put on immortality, then we're not immortal. And if we must put on incorruption, that means that we are corruptible. It's that simple. It's, you don't have to be a rocket scientist 
to figure out what this text is teaching. Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them. These are those who resurrected. They sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those, and I deal with this in the State of the Dead series. We don't have time to get into the idea of the souls. But it says, Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or in the, on their hands. Uh, are there some people that are going to go through the period of the beast, his image, and his mark that will be martyred? Before the close of probation. There will be martyrs. According to this passage. Because it says very clearly here that, th that there was a group of those who did not worship the beast or his image and did not receive the mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They were martyred. Because it continues saying, and they what? And they lived. Which must have meant that they were killed. And reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So when do they resurrect? Before the thousand years or after the thousand years? Well, they can't reign with Jesus a thousand years unless they resurrect at the beginning of the thousand years. And so they resurrected what the Bible calls what? The first resurrection. And then notice it says this is the what? This is the first resurrection. I've skipped the little phrase where it says the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. That's a parenthetical statement. It breaks the flow of thought. The NIV is better. Because the NIV puts parentheses around that aspect. The rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years were finished. Who must the rest of the dead be? Well, if, if the righteous resurrect at the beginning of the millennium and they reign with Christ a thousand years, it doesn't take much intelligence to figure out that the rest of the dead who do not live until after the thousand years are finished must be what? Must be the wicked. And then it says in verse 6, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So far so good? Okay, now let's talk about the general resurrection of the wicked. When, do, when is the general resurrection of the righteous? At what moment in history? At the second coming. Before the millennium begins. Then they're taken to heaven and they're going to perform a work of judgment. They're going to reign with Christ. They're going to be priests with Christ. They're going to have some priestly activities because we're going to be examining the books. That will be our priestly activity with Christ. Now, let's talk about the general resurrection of the wicked. We have several texts. Revelation 2, verse 11. It's on page 80 of your syllabus. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by what? By the second death. Now let's take a look at this issue of the second death. Second death is always spoken of as occurring after the millennium. Always. It's after the millennium. And there's a reason for that. Let's talk first of all, first of all about the righteous. An individual is born from, from his mother or from her mother, and they live for the first time, right? That's their, so to, so to speak, their first life. Then it's supposing that before Jesus comes, they die. Which death would that be? That would be their first death. When Jesus comes a second time, he will resurrect those who were faithful, and that is what? They return to life, so what life would that be? That would be their second life. Are they going to suffer second death? No. They resurrect to live forever. The wicked are different. Because the wicked also were born from their mothers the first time to their first life. They lived their wicked life. They died their first death. And then they resurrected to their second life, second stage of life, and then what do they suffer? You cannot suffer second death unless you have suffered first death first. Are you with me? Now, let's go here to another couple of texts. Revelation 20, verse 5. 
this is the part I left out of the previous passage. It says, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Revelation 20, verse 14. Notice it says, Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. When is the lake of fire? Before the millennium or after the millennium? After the millennium. So when are death and Hades, or the grave, cast into the lake of fire? After the millennium, it says this is the what? The second death. And then Revelation 20, 1 verse 8 says, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the what? Which is the second death. So when do the wicked resurrect? After the thousand years. And what do they suffer after they behold their life of sin and that God has been righteous in condemning them to be outside the holy city? They're destroyed in the lake of fire, which is what? Which is the second death. In other words, they will die for the second time and they will live no more. Now we've come to the point that we wanted to get to. The special resurrection. Now, there is a special resurrection that is going to take place before Jesus arrives at His second coming. First of all, there's going to be a group of wicked people, a special group of wicked people that are going to resurrect. Let's notice the Bible foundations for that idea. Matthew 23, 37 and 38. Matthew 23, 37 and 38. We read this last night. It says, or yesterday, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. Who is he speaking to here in Matthew chapter 23? He's speaking primarily to the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees. This is the conclusion of the, of the woes on the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders. And then notice what he says. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Are they going to see the second coming of Christ? Absolutely. Jesus said so. Now, Ellen White quotes this verse. Don't you think that they're going to say, Oh, we accept you, Jesus. Blessed are you who comes in the name of the Lord. No, Ellen White says that this is forced out of their lips because now they see Jesus differently than when they were, when they were mistreating him and leading him to the cross. Matthew 26, 64. This is when Jesus appears before the Jewish Sanhedrin. And he's speaking to Caiaphas. Jesus said to him, It is as you said, Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Are those who pierced Jesus, those His enemies that led Him to His crucifixion, are they going to see the second coming of Christ? Of course, do they have to be alive to see the second coming of Christ? Of course. Notice Revelation 1 verse 7, and there's, you can also find this in Matthew 24 verse 30. It says, Behold, He is coming with clouds, and every eye will see Him. Even whom? Even they who pierced Him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of Him. Even so, Amen. Is there a biblical foundation to teach that those who crucified and mistreated Jesus are going to resurrect in a special resurrection to see the second coming of Christ? Yes. And by the way, how do you know that this is just a special group of resurrected people? Simply because Revelation, we've already studied, says that the general resurrection of the wicked is after the millennium. Is that right? So must this be a special group? This has to be a special group. It can't be the general resurrection of the wicked to see the second coming because that takes place when? It takes place after the millennium. So the Adventist position is rock solid. Now, we need to deal with the special, res special resurrection of those who died in the faith of the third angel. That would be beginning which date? Around which date? 1843, 1844, right in that period. Now, let's read that verse. 
Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Is this uh, the, the resurrection of all? This is talking about all of the people who have died, they're blessed. All of the righteous who have died are blessed. Nope. It says clearly, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. From that point on. Now we're going to notice what that point is. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Now let's take a look at several details concerning this verse, the context in which it appears. This is very important. This text comes immediately after the third angel's message. Is that significant? This verse that we just read comes immediately after the verse that concludes the third angel's message. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In other words, the third angel's message ends, and then it says, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. So do they die in the third angel's message? And you thought that we needed to use Ellen White for that. We don't have to use Ellen White as a crutch. See, one reason why people... One reason why people reject Ellen White is because many times we prove things from the writings of Ellen White without proving it from Scripture. Now, am I saying that we don't respect and love the writings of Ellen White? Oh, no. Do you know? I work two ways. Sometimes I go to the writings of Ellen White and I read and I said, Ellen White, where did you ever get this from the Bible? I always ask that question. When she says something that I haven't uh, really understood before, I say, now I'm going to go to the Bible and see where she's coming from. Because I have to prove this from the Bible to people who are not Adventists. But I also do it the other way around. Sometimes I go to the Bible, and I find something in the Bible that is somewhat confusing. And so I say, I wonder what Ellen White has to say about this. And so I go to find out what Ellen White has to say. And then when I read what she says, I say, oh, that's interesting. That provides a little guidance for me, and then I go back to the biblical text. And I study the biblical text and other verses that Ellen White brings to view, and I find that she's in perfect harmony with Scripture. It's amazing. You know, what I've always told people when I speak about the spirit of prophecy, I said, don't get your opinion of someone from their friends or from their enemies. Don't get your opinion of someone from their friends because they'll make them look better than they are. And don't get your perspective of someone from their enemies because they'll make them look worse than they are. You go and get acquainted with them personally. And so I say, don't go to the internet. Don't go to the White Estate websites or to all of these websites that are trying to destroy the writings of Ellen White and her inspiration and her prophetic gift. Go and read the books for yourself. And there's two kinds of people that, that are not benefited by the writings of Ellen White. Uh, number one are those who come to the writings of Ellen White with the purpose of proving her wrong. If you come to the writings of Ellen White already believing that she's wrong, you will not be blessed. And then there are those that don't read her and that they're very critical. If you don't read her writings, you have no right to criticize. You go and you examine the scriptures. Now, so the first point is this text comes immediately after the third angel's message. Now listen carefully. And immediately before the second coming. Because the very next verse speaks about Jesus sitting on a cloud. And he has a sickle in his hand. And he's coming to harvest the earth. Is that the coming of Christ? So why do you have this verse that says, Blessed are those who die from now on in the Lord between two points of time, between the third angel's message and the second coming of Christ. Is there a special blessing pronounced upon people who die from 1844 till the second coming of Christ? Or till the close of probation? Absolutely. Now, let's notice also here, the word blessed is important. The blessing is not pronounced upon all who have died in the Lord. Did you see that point? 
It's not said, blessed are those, all of those who have died all throughout history. No, it's for those who die from this point on, from the time that the third angel's message is proclaimed. It is only pronounced on a special group who died in the Lord after the third angel's message began to be proclaimed. This is clearly indicated by the word henceforth, or as it's translated in the New King James, from now on. That's a temporal expression. Notice here that death is spoken of as what? I like that. Rest. You just sleep a little longer when you die. The message began, the third angel's message began to be proclaimed when? Around the year 1844. So those who die in the Lord after this date are blessed in a certain sense. Now the next statement might appear revolutionary. No Seventh-day Adventists who are saved will come forth in the general resurrection. <laughs> All will come forth in the special resurrection. All those who died after 1844. Now you say, why, why would Jesus do that? Why doesn't he resurrect all the righteous from before also? Let me explain the reason why. Do you think that if Martin Luther, to use a hypothetical example, if Martin Luther resurrected in the special resurrection when God's people are delivered at the end from the death decree, from the papacy and from apostate Protestantism and from all of these things that are happening, do you think Martin Luther would be able to understand what's happening? Do you think? He wouldn't have the foggiest idea because he didn't understand. He never studied about the beast about his image, about the mark. So if Martin Luther or any of the people who died before resurrected, they would be out of context. They wouldn't understand what's going on. Let me ask you, Adventists who have studied and resurrect at that moment, do they know exactly what's going on at that moment? You better believe they do because they know about the beast and they know about the false prophet and they know about the image and they know about the issue of Sabbath and Sunday observance and they know that the religious leaders are going to suffer what we talked about this morning. Are you understanding me? And so because God's people have understood this, Jesus says, I'm going to reward their knowledge. I'm going to resurrect them so that they can see the moment of deliverance. Praise the Lord. I'm glad I was born in this generation. <laughs> now let's go to page 81. Daniel 12, 7, 11, and 12. We're not going to read these texts, but I'm going to make some remarks about them. Some have attempted to make these time periods, the 1260, 1290, and 1335, uh, they've tried to understand them as literal time in the future. But Revelation 10, verse 6 precludes this possibility. This, this, um, it shouldn't be this, but these time periods. So you want to make a correction there. Not this time periods, that's bad grammar. These time periods had to end in 1844 at the very latest. Now you say, what are you talking about? What does Revelation 10, verse 6 say? Revelation 10, verse 6, listen carefully. You have an angel that raises his hand to heaven, his right hand. Why doesn't, in Daniel 12, he raises both? You have this in Revelation chapter, chapter 10. The angel raises both hands to heaven. But here it says he raises only his right hand. Do you know why? Because in, in Daniel chapter uh, 10, he didn't have the little book. But in Revelation chapter 10, he has the, the book in one hand and he's raising his other hand for the oath. In Revelation chapter 10, this angel raises his hand to heaven and he swears that time will be no longer. Now, is this talking about the end of the world, the end of time? It can't be referring to the end of the world when it says that time will be no longer. You say, why not? Two reasons. Reason number one, is that this is taking place during the period of the sixth trumpet. Revelation 10 is the period of the sixth trumpet. When does the end of the world come? Under the seventh trumpet. So that cannot, what happens in the sixth trumpet cannot be the end of time because the end of time is during the seventh trumpet. Are you following me? Even more importantly is the fact that after this experience when the angel says time will be no longer, 
Then the angel says to John, you know, eat the book, which is the portion of Daniel that has to do with the 2300-day prophecy. He says, devour the book, and it'll be sweet in your mouth. The judgment hour message was sweet in the mouth, but bitter, the aftermath was bitter. Then the angel says to John, you must go and you must prophesy again. If verse 6 means that time had come to an end, why go out and prophesy again? Are you with me? So the fact that he says you must prophesy again after he swears the oath that time will be no longer indicates that this is not the end of chronological time. This is the end of what? Of prophetic time periods. Prophetic time. Now let's go to the next point. The 1260, 1290, and 1335 days are mentioned. The 1260 days begin in 538 and end in 1798. Do you agree with that? That's our standard view. The 1290 days begin in 508 and end in 1798. We don't have time to get into this, but uh, you need to get Heidi Hikes' books. He has a whole book proving this, uh, this date, 508. There's a very important, significant event. This is the first time that church and state were joined together to enforce the doctrines of the papacy. When Clovis, king of the Franks, lent his power of the state to the Roman Catholic papacy. A very significant historical event. And, and because the, the state joined with the church, they set up the abomination of desolation. Now, the 1335 days begin in 508 and end in 1843. And as I mentioned, for extensive documentation on this, you need to read Heidi Hikes' book. books. They're phenomenal. You know, they have so many historical references that prove this beyond a shadow of a doubt. Notice the word blessed in Daniel 12, verse 12. This is the same word that appears in Revelation 14, 13, after the third angel's message. Right? In fact, let's notice that. Let's go to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 12. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 12. Let's be, read verse 11 for the context and from the time that the daily is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. We already spoke about that. Blessed, notice, blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. Which is around what year? 1843? 1844. Why are they blessed according to what we read in Revelation chapter 14 verse 13? Because they will resurrect in what? In the special resurrection. Allow me to read you some statements from Ellen White because some people are applying these time periods uh, and they're saying that these are literal prophetic time periods and they're setting dates for the National Sunday Law and the International Sunday Law and the beginning of the time of trouble. So notice these statements from Ellen White. And, and I have, by the way, seven pages of statements from Ellen White on the dangers of date setting. If you find anybody that's setting dates, run from them. Because God has not led them to teach. And we have some in our own midst in the Adventist church. One of them, actually quite recently, found deep prophetic significance to the seven years of famine and the seven years of plenty in the days of Joseph. And he actually says that the seven years of plenty was from 2001 to 2008. Yeah. And then he says in the first two years, you know, people, people lost their possessions and, and then they sold their soul basically to the government. He says that's what we see happening today because we're in the seven years of famine. You can't take a historical uh, narrative that you find in Genesis and apply the year-day principle to it. Come on. That is an unprincipled study of Scripture. Are you following me? Don't allow yourself to fall into those things. We cannot become Harold Campings. Do you know that there's a young uh, Adventist fellow? Uh, he's Hispanic. His name is Christian Silva. He's been attacking the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine of the Trinity and uh, in a hateful way. 
I mean, I've watched him on YouTube, and I know him personally. I had an experience with him. Maybe I can tell it to you, being that we have nothing better to do tonight after this meeting. <laughs> Other than go to the store. It was uh, in uh, February 2008. I was at Fresno Central Church greeting people as they came to church, and a couple of young men came. One of them had long hair, a ponytail from Argentina. You know, Argentines, uh, very commonly, the men use long hair, the football players and the men in general. But anyway, uh, when he, when he uh, talked to me, I knew he for, was from Argentina by his accent. And so he says, he says to me, Pastor Bohr, could, could we talk for a few minutes? I said, you know, I'd be glad to talk to you for as long as you want, but I can't do it now because I'm greeting the members as they come to church. So if you're willing to wait after I preach my sermon, I'll dedicate as much time as you want me to dedicate. So they said, fine. They sat there. They listened to the sermon. And then after the, the worship service, they came to my office, and I said, yes, what can I do for you? This young man says, Pastor Bohr, I have come here to give you a warning. My ears stood up on end. I said, what have I done wrong? <laughs> he says, I want you to know that next month in March, the city of Los Angeles is going to be totally destroyed by a devastating earthquake. And in April, this is 2008, in April, there's going to be a national Sunday law in the United States. And I looked at him in my usual diplomatic way. <laughs> and I pointed my finger at him and I said, you're a false prophet. And he looked, he, you know, his, his mouth kind of dropped open a little bit. And he says, why? I said, because the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy says that there's no more prophecies relating to specific time, especially not the Sunday law, Ellen White says, or the close of probation, or the second coming, or the outpouring of the latter rain. He says, and he begs me, he says, Pastor, please, please, I'm bringing you this warning. It's going to happen. I said, no, it's not going to happen. I said, please tell me where I can get in touch with you if it doesn't happen. So he gave me his email. The interview ended. Obviously, Los Angeles was not destroyed in 2008. And there was no national Sunday law in April of 2008. So when April had passed, I sent him an email. And I said, what happened with the earthquake in Los Angeles and with the Sunday law in April. For several months, I never got an answer. But then after several months, I get an email from him, and he says, Pastor Bohr, he never answered any of my questions about why this hadn't happened. He says, Pastor Bohr, I've discovered new light. He says, I've discovered that the doctrine of the Trinity is a pagan doctrine, that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is apostate. I even got baptized again because I was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says that was not in the original text. Jesus never spoke those words. And so I was baptized again in the name of Jesus. This young man, in no uncertain terms, you can find it on YouTube. Just uh, put there uh, in, uh, in your computer, Google, put... Uh, Christian Silva, by the way, Christian is without an H. It's C-R-I-S-T-I-A-N, Silva. And you'll find that he is saying that without a shadow of a doubt, Jesus Christ is coming to this world on October 15 of this year. And believe it or not, he has bunches of followers. In fact, a mother called me distressed from, from Venezuela. I've known this. She's a medical doctor. I've known her for, for, for quite a long time. She said, Pastor Bohr, please, could you call my son? Because he's, he's in the midst of this movement. He's deceived by it. So I called her son. And you should have heard him. He, he just begged me. He says, Pastor Bohr, please, please. Jesus is coming October 15. I said, no, he's not. There's too much that needs to still happen. The Muslims are unreached. The Buddhists are unreached. The Hindus are unreached. 
the Sunday law, the time of trouble, the plagues. There's so many things that still need to take place. I said, besides, no one knows the day or the hour. He says, oh, but that's talking about the unconverted that don't know the day or the hour. Talk about twisting the scriptures. And he just begged me. He said, Pastor, I want you to be in, in heaven with me on October 16. And I said, I would love to be with you in heaven, but it's not going to be October 16. And then I said to him, when October 16 comes around and nothing has happened, would you please call me so we can talk some more? He refused to say that he would call and talk to me. Yeah, we have date setters in the Adventist church now. Not to the greater degree, like this fellow, but folks, let's not set dates. All prophetic time periods are finished. Ellen White says there will always be false and fanatical movements made up by persons in the church. Persons where? Oh, in the church, who claim to be led of God, those who will run before they are sent, and will give day and date for the occurrence of unfulfilled prophecy. The enemy is pleased to have them do this, for their successive failures and leading into false lines cause confusion and unbelief. In Manuscript Releases, volume 10, page 270, she says, Our position has been one of waiting and watching with no time proclamation to intervene between the close of the prophetic periods in 1844 and the time of our Lord's coming. Now what part of no time proclamation to intervene do you not understand? In the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, volume 7, page 971, she says the people will not have another message upon definite time. After this period of time, she's referring to Revelation 10, 4 through 6, reaching from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. Now, we need to go quickly. Time is up. Should we end? Let's take a vote. <laughs> Will you give me another 15 minutes? Maybe I need to ask for permission from Eileen, the boss. <laughs> well, let's go ahead. We'll do this quickly. Daniel 12 and verse 2. Let's read that verse. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. First of all, it speaks about Michael. Let's read verse 1 for the context. It says, at that time, Michael shall stand up. We'll deal with that in a few moments. Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time, and at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Who are those who are delivered, the dead or the living? We studied that this morning, right? Who is delivered? Ah, God's people are delivered from the death decree. And then notice verse 2. And all those who sleep... Is this a general resurrection? No. It says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Not all. Many. Are there righteous and wicked among these many? Don't the wicked resurrect after the millennium? Are there some many that will resurrect before? Yes. It says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to what? To shame and everlasting contempt. Now, let's skip the summary. So far, so good? That was weak. Okay, let me ask the question again. I want you to say yes if you understand it. So far, so good? Yes. All right, that was still weak. Now, let's take a look at Ellen White's timing of the special resurrection. See, Ellen White understood this. She understood that there was a resurrection before the general resurrection. I'm only going to give you the pages. We don't have the time to look up the, the, the passages. But in Great Controversy 6.13, she begins that chapter by quoting Daniel 12 and verse 1. 
What does it mean when it says that Michael shall stand up? Well, Daniel 11, verses 2, 3, and 4 describe standing up as beginning to reign. Let's read that. Daniel 11, verses 2, 3, and 4 says, And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia. That word arise is the identical word stand up. So what does this text mean when it says, Behold, three kings will stand up in Persia. They will begin to what? They will begin to reign. So when Michael stands up, that means that he's going to begin to what? To reign because his kingdom is made up. Now he's no longer priest. He is what? He is king. You know, and someone once facetiously, facetiously said to me, well, Pastor Bohr, I know Ellen White says that, that Jesus is going to change his priestly robes to his kingly robes, where do you find that in the Bible? So I answered quite facetiously, and I said, let me ask you something. What is the function of Jesus in the sanctuary now? What is he doing in the sanctuary? What is his function? He said, oh, he's high priest. So I said, good, so how is he dressed? Oh, he's dressed as a high priest, of course, if he's serving as a high priest. So then I had him softened up. And I said, and when Jesus comes, how is he going to be clothed? He, and he looks at me and he says, well, it says in Revelation 19 that he comes garbed as a king, as king of kings and lord of lords. So I said, then some, sometime between one point and the other, he must have changed. It's in Scripture. You just have to search for it. Now, on pages 613 to 634, listen carefully, Ellen White describes the time of trouble. You see, following Daniel 12, verse 1, At that time Michael shall stand up, that prince that stands in favor of your people, and there shall be a what? She's following the sequence of the verse. There shall be a time of trouble such as nev there never was since there was a nation. On page 635, she speaks about what? We talked about that this morning, the death decree, when they're going to execute the death decree. On pages 635 and 636, as we read this morning, she describes God's living saints delivered by the voice of God. By the way, the fact that they are written in the book indicates that they went through a pre-advent judgment when they were written in the book. And then notice, on page 637, Ellen White describes the special resurrection and she quotes Daniel 12, verse 2. Is she following the identical sequence of Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 and 2? She is following the chronological sequence. First of all, Michael stands up. Then there's a time of trouble. Then God's people are delivered from the death decree. Then she speaks about the special resurrection in verse 2. And listen to what she says. After she resurrects, after Jesus resurrects, these individuals, and she describes them as being those who pierced Jesus and those who died in the faith of the message of the third angel. After that, she says that Jesus announces the day and hour of his coming. So does this resurrection take place before Jesus actually comes? It takes place, by the way, at the moment of the fifth plague. So what we study this morning, if any of us should die when we resurrect, we won't be out of place. We'll know exactly what's happening. <laughs> so on page 640, you have the announcement of the day and hour of the coming of Jesus. Great controversy 640 and 641. A little bit further ahead, you have the second coming of Jesus concluding. He's above the earth. And then in page 644, she speaks about the general resurrection of the righteous. Is she right? She's absolutely right, biblically correct. Now let's deal with two issues before we bring this to an end. Will Ellen White be among the 144,000? No. You say, what do you mean no? Well, go with me in your syllabus to page 
64. Page 64. We're going to read Ellen White's description of the 144,000. And you tell me by the description if Ellen White's going to be in that group. Ellen White says, Upon the crystal sea before the throne, at the bottom of page 64, Upon the crystal sea before the throne, that sea of glass, as it were, mingled with fire, so resplendent is it with the glory of God, are gathered the company that have gotten the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name. Did Ellen White win the victory over the mark of the beast? Did she? No, because the mark of the beast has not been imposed yet. Did she refuse to worship the image? Had the image been raised up? Absolutely not. Had all the world wondered after the beast? Absolutely not. She continues saying, With the Lamb upon Mount Zion, having the harps of God, they stand, the 144,000 who that were redeemed from among men. And there is heard as the sound of many waters and as the sound of a great number, the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sing a new song before the throne, a song which no man can learn save the 144,000. We talked about that this morning. Will, will they be able to understand the words? Sure. But they will not be able to sing the song with experience. It is the song of Moses and the Lamb, a song of deliverance. None but the 144,000 can learn that song, for it is the song of their what? Of their experience. An experience such as no other company have ever had. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These having been translated. What does translated mean? Does Ellen White fit? No. These having been translated from the earth from among the living are accounted as the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. These are there which came out of the great tribulation. Now, do you notice how Ellen White blends the description of the great multitude and the 144,000? It's like for her, there's no distinction. Have you noticed the text? Uh, she's quoted Revelation 15, 2, Revelation 15, 14, 1, Revelation 14, 4, Revelation 15, 3, Revelation 14, 3, Revelation 14, 1. And then suddenly she's speaking about the same group without any break, and she quotes Revelation 7, 14, which is speaking about the great multitude. She says, These are they which came out of great tribulation. Actually, that's not the best translation. In the Greek it says, who came out of the tribulation, the great one. That's what it literally says in Greek. They have passed through the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Did Ellen White go through that? No. They have endured the anguish of the time of Jacob's trouble. Did Ellen White experience that? They have stood without an intercessor. Did Ellen White experience that? No. Through the final outpouring of God's judgments, which is what? The seven last plagues. But they have been what? Ah, delivered. For they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Once again, it's a verse that has to do with the great multitude. In their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault. Now she's quoting back to about the 144,000. Are you with me? Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They have seen the earth wasted with famine and pestilence, the sun having power to scorch men with great heat. That's the, the fourth flag, by the way. And they themselves have endured suffering, hunger, and thirst, but they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat, for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Does Ellen White fit with this description? No. Ellen White never says that she will be among the 144,000. She always uses the preposition with. Is it different for me to be among than to be with? Among means that you belong to. With means that you're simply with the group. Now, why would Ellen White say, that she would be with, why would the angel tell on white that she would be with the 144,000? It's very simple. Because when the 144,000 are delivered, Ellen White is going to be resurrected in the special resurrection and she will be with them. Are you understanding me? In other words, 
the special blessing of those who resurrect in the special resurrection is that we will have the privilege of being witnesses of the second coming of Christ from beginning to end. The rest of the righteous will see Jesus when he's above the earth, once he has arrived. Now notice what Ellen White, this is only one of the statements, early writings, page 39. She says, then the angel said, you must go back. This must have been torture for her. And if you are faithful, you, with the 144,000, shall have the privilege of visiting all the worlds and viewing the handiwork of God. Now let's deal with one final point before we bring this to a close. That is something that Ellen White said in 1850 about a sister Hastings. Uh, this woman died and her husband was bereaved and Ellen White wrote a letter of comfort. And notice what we find here uh, in Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 263. Ellen White writes, I hardly know what to say to you. The news of your wife's death was to me overwhelming. I could hardly believe it and can hardly believe it now. God gave me a view, that means by the way a vision, God gave me a view last Sabbath night which I will write. Now listen carefully. I saw that she was sealed. See, there's a problem. 144,000 are sealed, but this woman died and she's sealed. How do we resolve this? We'll see that in a minute. I saw that she was sealed and would come up at the voice of God. That's when God's people are delivered. Remember, it is done. So she would come up at the voice of God and stand upon the earth and would be with the 144,000. I saw we need not mourn for her. She would rest in the time of trouble. Does, is this woman going to be among the 144,000? No, because we read that the 144,000 go through the time of trouble. Here Ellen White says that she will rest in the time of trouble, and all that we could mourn for, her, for was our loss of being deprived of her company. I saw her death would result in good. So the final page. The question is, how could Mrs. Hastings be sealed if the seal of God is given at the very end of time just before the close of probation? Ellen White is clear that the seal of God will be received in the same time frame as the mark of the beast, and the mark of the beast had not yet been given in 1899. So this woman died in 1850, and in 1899 Ellen White is saying nobody has received the mark of the beast yet. The trial of the mark of the beast has not come. Let's read that that uh, specific passage, Manuscript 51, 1899, no one has yet received the mark of the beast. So no one either has received what? The seal of God that is mentioned in Revelation 7. The testing time has not yet come. There are true Christians in every church not, church not accepting the Roman Catholic communion. None are condemned until they have the light and have seen the obligation of the fourth commandment. But when the decree shall go forth enforcing the counterfeit Sabbath, and the loud cry of the third angel shall warn men against the worship of the beast and his image, the line will be clearly drawn between the false and the true. Then those who still continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast. So had the mark of the beast been imposed uh, before the year 1899? No. How about the seal of God? Notice our final quotation. In 1911, Ellen White said this in great controversy about the righteous. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty, for it is the point of truth especially controverted. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, did Sister Hastings go, Hastings go through that final test? No. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve Him not. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth, fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receive the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, received the seal of God. Had the seal of God been given, this seal of Revelation 7, before 1911? No. 
had the mark of the beast been given before 1911? So how do we understand Ellen White's comment that this woman had been sealed? I believe the answer is twofold. Let me ask you, when we die, is our case sealed? For life or for death? Absolutely. Is there a sense in which when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are sealed? You see, the last section deals with the fact that there is a gospel seal and there is an eschatological seal. In other words, there's a gospel seal that everyone receives when they receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. There's another seal, which is the one that is received at the very end of time, before the close of probation and the final time of trouble. Had Miss Sister Hastings been sealed with the gospel seal, was her case already decided, according to Ellen White? Was she secure and sure in the Lord? Yes, but she did not have the seal that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 7. She had the seal of the Holy Spirit, and she had the seal of God in the sense that her case had been decided for life. So did you learn anything tonight? Isn't this a fascinating thing? It puts all the chronology together. It just puts everything together in a structure. Now my prayer is, folks, that this will not only be academic, but that by our choices and by drawing close to Jesus and spending time in His Word and spending time in prayer and spending time in witnessing and coming to church and becoming active in some function in the church, that we will prepare a character that when the crunch time comes, when crisis comes, we will receive the seal of God and be able to go successfully through the time of trouble. I'm not predicting this but I believe that we're very, very close to the end. And I believe that the time of trouble such as never was is very soon to come. May God bless us and help us to be on the right side in this time of great knowledge and great truth and great light that God has given us, that we might not hide the light under a bushel, but that we might share it and live it in our lives. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of studying uh, these ma magnificent things from your word and from the spirit of prophecy. Father, as we look upon the different resurrections, we see that each one of these resurrections had a specific purpose. We know that there's a special purpose for those who come forth in the special resurrection. And Father, if we should die, we want to rest in Jesus. And we want to resurrect in that special resurrection to see your people delivered everyone who is found written in the book. So, Father, draw us close to Jesus. Help us to get serious about the Lord. We pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.